names are here, and I'm going to introduce each one uh, as before they get up to speak. Uh, what we're going to be doing here this afternoon is comparing the idea of abolition versus moratorium and trying to give you a review of some of the current things that are happening uh, in the United States and worldwide. Uh, there are certainly advantages to each one of those propositions. Abolition, uh, you know, you scratch more, most moratorium people and you're going to find a little bit of abolition there. Uh, and the same with abolition, if you scratch it, you're going to find moratorium underneath it. Uh, abolition, of course, means that uh, you're asking that the death penalty be prohibited uh, within the state. Moratorium means you're asking that it be stopped until they can figure a way to do it fairly. And uh, that seems to be attractive for some people who aren't quite willing to go to abolition. I was at a conference at the Carter Center recently, and Governor Ryan was there, who has, of course, established a moratorium in Illinois on the death penalty because there were so many innocent people that were, had been found on death row. And uh, I, he felt that uh, that was a good enough reason to be unsure about that you weren't applying the death penalty to people who were innocent. Uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at today. And our, our first speaker uh, is John Quigley. Oh, you're going to go first. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, Enid Carlo is our first speaker. I had to be in the wrong order here. And uh, I'd like to introduce her. She's the Deputy Acting Director of the program to abolish the death penalty, and she does that work for Amnesty uh, International USA, and she is also a longtime human rights advocate, and uh, I'd like you to give a welcome to her. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to give you just a chronological roundup of uh, moves towards abolition. Um, in international law as pertaining to the death penalty. Um, Amnesty International is an abolitionist organization. As most of you know, we're a human rights organization. We are uh, working towards the abolition of the death penalty worldwide. We support moratorium um, as a step towards abolition, but not in itself. Um, today, well, as of January 1st, 2000. 73 countries in the world have abolished the death penalty. In 1938, there were only eight countries in the world that had done so. So um, I'm going to show you a chronological move that shows that this, uh, the abolition of the death penalty is steadily evolving as a customary norm of international human rights law. Um, and the most recent moves towards abolition on March 21st of this year, Malta abolished the death penalty for all crimes. On March 24th of 2000, the Philippines announced a moratorium on executions uh, that would last for at least the remainder of the year. On July 23rd of the year 2000, the Côte d'Ivoire abolished the death penalty for all crimes. Uh, now we'll go back to 1948 with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, known as the UDHR adopted by the UN in 1948. Article 3 affirms the right to life for everyone. And this, this is what uh, Amnesty International bases in, in large part its opposition to the death penalty on Article 3 of the UDHR. Um, that, one of the drafters, as, as you may know, of the UDHR was Eleanor Roosevelt. And um, in Article 3, she made it clear that uh, the right to life was not to be associated with uh, the execution of a sentence pronounced by any court. This is different from the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which states that no person shall be held to answer for capital crime unless on presentment of an indictment of a grand jury, or nor shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And Article 3 is not associated with a sentence of execution pronounced by a court. So it, it occurs in that the, the right to life. Um, so we believe that as far back as 1948, this treaty foresaw as a common standard for humankind the abolition of the death penalty. Uh, 
1990, the protocol to the American Convention on Human Rights to abolish the death penalty um, to the OAS Treaty was adopted on June 8th, and that states that parties to this treaty shall not apply the death penalty in their territory to any person subject to, to their jurisdiction. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago withdrew from the American Convention on Human Rights in May of 1998 and have since resumed capital punishment. In 1993, we have perhaps um, one of the strongest uh, treaties showing that abolition of the death penalty has clearly emerged as an international human rights norm with the International War Crimes Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. This states that the death penalty is not an option even for the most heinous crimes committed ever, such as genocide. 1997, the United Nations Human Rights Commission passed its first resolution condemning capital punishment. It called on all countries to suspend executions and um, singled out the United States as being one of the worst offenders. On October 2nd, 97, the Treaty of Amsterdam was signed, and this uh, applies to all members of the European Union, and they may not uh, <coughs> join the European Union without abolishing the death penalty. In 1998, on April 4th, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary Execution stated that the application of the death penalty in the United States is tainted by racism, economic discrimination politics, and an excessive deference to victims' rights." Unquote. On July 17, uh, 120 nations voted to establish a permanent international criminal court, ICC, for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. And again, with the ICC, the death penalty is not permitted as a punishment, even for those most serious of all crimes. On April 28, 1999, the UN Commission on Human Rights called for a worldwide moratorium on capital punishment. Uh, the Commission passed the resolution calling on all states that still maintain the death penalty to, quote, progressively restrict the number of offenses for which the death penalty may be imposed, to establish a moratorium on executions with a view to completely abolishing the death penalty, and to make available to the public information with regard to the imposition of the death penalty. On August 24, 1999, the UN Subcommission on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights adopted a resolution which included a call on all countries to commute all death sentences and to commit to a moratorium throughout uh, the year 2000. The resolution condemned unequivocally the imposition of the death penalty on those aged under 18 at the time of the crime. And again, the United States was singled out as one of the worst offenders in this regard. Now we're up to uh, the year 2000, and several significant things have happened this year. In um, April, the UN Commission on Human Rights expressed the conviction that abolition of the death penalty, quote, contributes to the enhancement of human dignity and to the progressive development of human rights, end quote. On July 4th, 15 members of the European Union called upon countries worldwide that still practice, the capital, that still practice capital punishment to abolish it. On August 17th, the UN Subcommission on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights adopted a resolution which confirmed that the execution of those who were under the age of 18 at the time of the crime violates customary international law. And the subcommission added that it condemns unequivocally such use of the death penalty and called upon all offending states to abolish it as soon as possible. Um, now, a, a principle of customary international law is one that is a general principle and is accepted as law and is binding on all countries regardless of which treaties they have or have not ratified. Uh, recently, October 2nd, uh, 2nd of this month, the Inter International Commission of Jurists, the ICJ, condemned executions by lethal injection. This is practiced by 36 states in the United States, and it's, uh, the ICJ said that attempts by the U.S. to, quote, humanize, unquote, the execution process by favoring injection over electrocution or hanging merely prolongs 
uh, the torture. Um, so that's the wrap up up to 2000. I just want to say a couple words on the, uh, the ICCPR, um, which prohibits the execution of juveniles. The United States ratified uh, the ICCPR in 1992. At the time, it did make a reservation to Article 6, which is the article that prohibits the execution of juveniles. And in effect, the United States said, we'll do anything we want in regard to the death penalty. Um, most scholars mean that, believe that this means that um, since 1992 and up to October 1st of this year, 2000, um, since which date the United States has executed 17 juvenile offenders, um, most uh, scholars would say that we are in violation of international law and have been since um, ratifying the ICCPR in 1992. Um, 11 European countries voice their objection to the U.S.'s reservation on Article 6. Um, and saying that uh, the reservation is incompatible with the article's purpose and intent. And that states who have ratified it are fully obliged to implement its provisions. So that, um, so that as far as the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which the United States signed in 1995 but has not yet ratified. Only the United States, the Cook Islands, and Somalia have not ratified this convention. Uh, the United States has made it clear that if and when it ever does ratify the convention, it will make a, a reservation to the article which refers to um, not executing people who were below the age of 18 at the time of crime. One more thing, and I'm on mental illness, virtually every country in the world prohibits the execution of people with mental illness. Um, the United States does not. On mental retardation, uh, that is a little more complicated because the, the definition of mental retardation differs from country to country. And, and also, uh, when surveys go out, the, the UN conducts a survey every five years for retentionist countries, countries that still maintain the death penalty, and ask them certain questions. And among the questions um, it asks is, um, does your country allow for the execution of people with mental retardation? Many countries simply don't even answer the survey, so it's, it's hard to, um, to, to gather any um, firm data from, from those surveys. But what Amnesty has uh, passed on to me is that the fifth quinquennial survey, which covers the year 18, I'm sorry, 1989 to 1993, um, Tonga, Trinidad, and Tobago, and Tunisia said that they had no legal prohibitions on executing people with mental retardation. Uh, and Tunisia said that in practice, a person with mental retardation would not be sentenced to death. In the next uh, survey covering 1994 to 1998, only Tonga reported that executing people with mental retardation was not outlawed. Um, but again, many countries did not um, did not respond to the survey. Um, up until October 1, 2000, the United States has executed 35 people with mental retardation. There are only 13 states in the United States that explicitly prohib prohibit the execution of people with mental retardation. <coughs> and uh, finally, on foreign nationals on death row, which you'll hear more about immediately, uh, the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations applies to that, which the United States is a part of. As of October 1st, 14 foreign nationals have been executed by the United States. The Vienna Convention states that any foreign national upon arrest in this country is entitled to, um, to contact from his or her consulate. 
virtually none of these people, who, the 14 who have been executed in the United States, were informed of their rights to communicate with their consular representative. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Ian. I'd like to just add just a little bit to what was said. Uh, I think you're being very honest with our audience when you say that 73 countries have, have, have actually abolished the death penalty, but uh, uh, Bill Chavis says that over half the countries in the world have. Yes. And if you add to the, uh, if you add to the 73, those countries which have de facto abolished the death penalty or have so limited it, say, to treason, that in fact it is actually abolished. Uh, you, reach, you reach 106 countries, uh, according to Ben Nanda, that have abolished it, leaving 90 countries uh, which still have it. But that's, it all depends on how you, how you define these things. Uh, but I'd like also, to, I liked your mentioning uh, the European Union and the Treaty of Amsterdam, because I think it should give all of us a little bit of uh, thought as to what we can do about the death penalty in the United States. Uh, in the Treaty of Amsterdam, the Council of Europe abolished the death penalty for all countries that wanted to get into the European Union. And of course, countries are scrambling to get into the European Union because of the economic benefits that it has for their citizens. And uh, I think some of you have probably heard of this, that occasionally there are people who visit uh, the European Union in order to say, let's have a boycott on those states in the United States that uh, still have the death penalty. Uh, they've not been successful, and a lot of people think they never will be successful uh, on that. But uh, if, if the economics could be touched upon, the economics, if it could be made economically bad for a state to have the death penalty, I think we might very soon have a very different result. I'm going to now introduce our second speaker, uh, who is uh, Professor John Quigley. Uh, he's the President's Club Professor in Law at Ohio State University. He's written widely on international criminal law, and he served as counsel to the government of Mexico in writing amicus briefs in cases of Mexican nationals who have been sentenced to death in the United States. And uh, so I introduce uh, Professor Quigley. Thank you. Um, I'd like to build on what, uh, what you had said. I, uh, I think that's a very powerful um, exposition of the current practice in the world with regard to the death penalty. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, ruminate a bit over the significance of this and, and whether it will have any impact on the United States, which is, a, I think, um, uh, a, a question that, um, well, it's one that, that, that I don't have an immediate answer for, so I won't give you anything uh, uh, hard and fast. Um, but many of the issues that uh, relate to the legality of the death penalty came very close to getting to the U.S. Supreme Court last year in a case out of Nevada uh, that involved a, a young man who had been under the age of 18 when he committed a crime, uh, a, a crime of murder for which he was convicted and sentenced to death. Um, and the Supreme Court was considering uh, taking certiorari in the case. Ultimately, it decided not to take certiorari in the case. Uh, but that case would have raised uh, these issues about whether the United States is in violation of international law for executing juveniles uh, under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to which it is a party, as you've already heard, uh, or under customary international law. Now, while the U.S. Supreme Court did deny certiorari, prior to doing that, it asked the Solicitor General for a brief uh, to help the court make its decision on whether to grant certiorari. Uh, and the Solicitor General did write a brief, uh, taking positions that I'm sure Enid would, would be, uh, well, I know she knows the, the brief, she's I'm sure aghast at, as, uh, as many of us are, at the positions the Solicitor General took in the, um, in the brief, um, arguing that the United States is within its rights to execute juveniles uh, both under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights by virtue of the U.S. reservation to Article 6, the, the, the provision that, that uh, prohibits the execution of criminals, uh, and with respect to customary international law, um, and the Solicitor General arguing that, that there is not a principle of customary international law that, that prohibits uh, capital punishment even with respect to, uh, to juveniles. Um, 
those are, are, are uh, very difficult issues. Customary law is a, is a very tricky thing in international law. Um, and you first have the, the question of the amount of state practice you need before you have a, a customary norm. Uh, then you also have a possible escape valve through a doctrine that's, that's called the persistent objector doctrine that says that even if there is a customary norm, a particular state doesn't have to abide by it if it, if it persistently objects to it. Uh, then you have a uh, kind of counter notion to that, which is the notion of use Kogan's, uh, which says that if a customary norm rises to uh, another level uh, uh, of validity, uh, which nobody knows exactly what that means, but, um, but that we call use Kogan's, uh, that then you can't opt out of it by being a persistent objector. So uh, uh, all of that would have gotten argued before the U.S. Supreme Court uh, uh, had, had this case uh, gone. The, the question of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the, the U.S. of course takes the position that uh, it has the right to make a reservation. Um, uh, and that it has done so, and, and uh, that that's valid internationally, and, and uh, the Solicitor General argued that as a matter of domestic uh, U.S. law uh, under the Supremacy Clause, that is valid as well. Um, but as Ina has pointed out, a number of European states have objected to the uh, uh, reservation by the United States on the grounds that it is inconsistent with the object and purpose of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, to execute juveniles, um, and the, uh, the committee that monitors the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights um, has also severely criticized the United States for this and, and other reservations to the International Covenant. Um, so there is some question about the, the validity of those, uh, of that reservation, um, but um, what I'd like to talk about is less the, the legality than the, uh, the significance of all of this pressure that's coming um, at the United States on the subject of capital punishment. Uh, and I think it, it's very strong pressure. Uh, you have this uh, growing body of practice that is against youth, use of the death penalty um, uh, around the world, uh, and a practice that is particularly strong with respect to execution of juveniles and execution of people with mental retardation or other mental problems. In, in those two categories, you find the United States very, very isolated uh, in the world with respect to execution. It's, it's hard to find states that, 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 uh, that execute uh, juveniles or that execute people with uh, any serious mental problem. Um, so, on, uh, certainly from the legal side, on those issues, one would have a much stronger argument that these have risen to the level not only of, of customary law, but perhaps of use tokens. Um, the pressure that's coming at the United States is coming, uh, I think, largely from our friends, which is a factor that I think makes the pressure the more significant. Uh, the, the two continents that are most opposed to the use of capital punishment are Latin America and Europe, which are the two continents that are closest historically, culturally, politically to, uh, to the United States. Um, uh, in Europe, as you've heard, there is a treaty that, that prohibits the use of the death penalty, um, except in, in uh, wartime. Um, and in Latin America, you only have one or two very uh, small states that, that use the death penalty uh, at, at all. Um, and, and in Europe, I think as Dorian has mentioned, this is rather uh, incredible development that the European states are pressuring Eastern Europe on the question of capital punishment, telling them, you know, if you want to be civilized enough to join our economic union, one of the things you have to do is abolish the death penalty. Um, I've worked with the various agencies of the U.S. government on programs that it has in Eastern Europe called Rule of Law, where, where the United States has programs to promote the rule of law. Uh, and now the European countries come in and say, well, if you, really, if you want the rule of law, you have to abolish the death penalty. And, and, and we have these programs where we're saying, well, you have to have the rule of law, but uh, you know, maybe, not a, 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 maybe it doesn't include the abolition of the death penalty. Um, it puts the United States in an awkward position. Uh, and, and this is uh, relevant to a, a point that I, I want to make more broadly um, in trying to assess the significance of all the opposition that the United States is getting. That is, it, it's 
unlikely that any single um, event or denunciation is going to lead to a change in practice in the United States. But when you look at it overall and over a period of time, I think it does create for the United States uh, a, a very serious, I use the word inconvenience, uh, which may seem like not an appropriate word in this context, but, but in, the, in the context of international pressure, inconvenience is something that states like to avoid. They like to have smooth relations with other states of the world. Uh, and when they, they are constantly getting difficulty on an issue, um, uh, it bothers them. When the United States goes to some other state and wants to discuss something like free trade, globalization, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, and gets hit with death penalty, you know, it's, it's an annoyance uh, at the very least. It's the kind of thing states like not to happen. Uh, I think the most recent um, efforts on, on the part of, of the European states um, uh, have added something, added another level of inconvenience. Just this year, in, in April, the European Parliament uh, called on President Clinton uh, to institute a moratorium on federal executions in the United States, that is to, uh, not to execute any federal uh, prisoners. Uh, at that point, there was a, 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 a man uh, who was getting very close to uh, an execution date as uh, uh, he would have been the first person to be executed under the, the laws that Congress has passed now on, on capital punishment uh, in the post Furman period. Uh, uh, so it, it would have been the first execution for a very long time uh, under uh, federal law. Uh, and the European Parliament um, uh, asked President Clinton to institute a moratorium on federal executions. Um, then in, in July of this year, the European Union, the, which is the new incarnation of the European Economic Community, um, it did the same thing. It also called on President Clinton to uh, institute a moratorium on federal executions. And it specifically referred to the uh, one individual who was at that point uh, scheduled for early execution and asked the president to exercise the power of clemency with respect to that, uh, that person. Um, these are rather extraordinary things for, for friendly states to do um, one to another. States usually avoid getting into the domestic policy of other states. It's, it's considered uh, intrusive, it's considered unfriendly, um, it's considered something that can, can upset uh, relations on other issues, um, and it's something that can also invite uh, retribution from another state, uh, you know, that, that in the future the United States now will say, uh, when some issue comes up on which it wants to criticize European states of original policy, it will say, ah, remember when they criticized us about capital punishment? Well, you know, we'll go ahead and criticize them. So um, it, it's, a, it's a rather strong step for, uh, for the European states to take, I think, uh, to be making this kind of representation. Um, for a number of years now, European states and others um, have uh, given the United States some uh, problems on capital punishment in another realm, and that is with respect to extradition. Uh, when persons uh, who are sought on capital charges uh, are, are found in Europe uh, or other countries, uh, those states are often reluctant to uh, extradite them absent an assurance by the United States that there will not be uh, capital punishment in that case. Many of our extradition treaties, in fact, have provisions that, that allow a state to uh, refuse to surrender a person who is sought uh, on a capital charge. Uh, so this, this has created uh, difficulties for the United States uh, in, 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 uh, in quite a few cases where it has been forced to make a, a, a promise that there would not be capital punishment um, if the person is surrendered. Uh, this has created problems, uh, in fact, for some of our, our close allies. And I think this is another kind of level of inconvenience that has entered into the picture. Um, both the UK and Canada uh, have, at, at various times over the last decade or so, uh, have have had in their territory persons sought by the United States um, and have not quite known how to handle it. Uh, Canada, I think, feels it has a particular problem because of, a, of the border it has with the United States. It doesn't want to become a harbor. So despite Canada's opposition to, the, to capital punishment, it has been willing, in, in some cases at least, to, uh, to surrender persons on capital charges. Um, 
Uh, the UK has taken a, a somewhat ambivalent stand on it. Um, uh, a few years ago, it was uh, it made the decision that it would uh, surrender someone who was slapped by the state of Virginia. Uh, that man then went to the European Court of Human Rights that said that the UK would be in violation uh, of the European uh, Human Rights Treaty were it to surrender the person to the United States. The theory being that, yeah, that uh, the kind of, of, uh, uh, of uh, treatment that the person would receive in Virginia uh, would be inhuman and degrading, and that's uh, in violation of a provision of the European Human Rights Treaty. Uh, the UK said, well, that's the European Human Rights Treaty. And that doesn't apply to something done by the United States outside our territory if we surrender. European court said, no, it does apply uh, in that situation. Um, Canada has had the same problem, uh, as I say, it, it was uh, about to surrender someone uh, to California a few years ago who would have been uh, executed if, uh, if he had been convicted on the capital charge in that case, would have been executed in the gas chamber. Um, and the fellow argued that the gas chamber was inhuman and degrading under the, the standard in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights on that issue. Um, and the, the committee that monitors that uh, international covenant said, uh, you're right, uh, they looked into the gas chamber in, in, uh, uh, in California, how it was administered, um, and told Canada that it would be in violation were it to surrender the person. I mean, uh, my point about these two cases, at least in, in the present context, is that the United States is creating inconvenience internationally, not only for itself, but, some, but for some of our closest allies. Um, uh, and that's something that, that states normally want to avoid. Uh, they don't want to, uh, to have that kind of an issue, uh, uh, cloud relations with, with close allies. The um, other way in which foreign governments have gotten involved, uh, and even referred to briefly, is, is the situation in which the uh, person charged is a foreign national. Um, and foreign consuls in the United States have, over the last decade, become very active in opposing the execution of their own nationals. They will um, make uh, representations uh, to the Department of State. They, they will file protests with the Department of State. Uh, they will file briefs as amicus curiae uh, in, uh, in courts. In, in one case, the, uh, the foreign consul actually intervened in the case and became a party to the case at the appellate stage uh, uh, after conviction on a capital charge. Um, and I think this is another uh, element of pressure on the United States. That, that the State Department is constantly getting these uh, uh, complaints from the, the ambassador of this country or that country uh, about the pending execution of a, a national of, of that um, country. Um, one of the more interesting cases recently went to the Supreme Court of Illinois. It was decided a few months ago. Uh, and the, uh, this is the case that I was just mentioning in which a, a foreign consul actually became a party by intervening it was the, the Polish uh, consul in, in Chicago. Um, and the case um, involved a Polish national who had, had been um, sentenced to death. And as Enid said, as far as, as, as those of us who are involved with this issue can tell, uh, in practically all of the instances where a foreign national has been sentenced to death in the United States, it has been the case that the person was not informed at the time of arrest or trial of the right to contact the consul of, of their home state for assistance. I mean, the idea uh, of, of this provision in, in the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations is, is to uh, uh, allow a foreign national to have the, the kind of support services that, 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 that nationals uh, customarily will have from, uh, from family or, or community. Um, uh, and, and so as somehow to equalize the, the standing of these people with respect to their ability to defend on a criminal charge. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in this case, in the Illinois Supreme Court, uh, the Illinois Supreme Court affirmed the conviction by a vote of four to three. Three of the judges would have reversed on the grounds of violation of the, the uh, uh, the convention obligation. Uh, and in fact, one of the judges who was in the majority said he thought that 
the uh, uh, United States should arrange for the person to serve a sentence in Poland. So one of the four judges who was in the majority didn't <laughs> seem to think that he w should be subjected to capital punishment either because in Poland he wouldn't be subjected to capital punishment because as we've heard, Poland can't join the European Union unless it's become civilized uh, and, and so <laughs> Poland uh, would not execute him. Um, now, um, I think often these cases can, can, uh, can result in some significant results. We've had a number of, of uh, counties in the United States where following the, uh, the raising of this issue, prosecutors and judges have altered their procedures to make sure that foreigners get much better treatment, whether they're up on a capital charge or, or any uh, kind of charge. Uh, at all. Uh, this Vienna Convention obligation applies to all criminal charges, not only capital charges, uh, but the councils you know, exert more effort when it's a, a serious case, especially uh, a capital case. Uh, but it also relates to how, uh, how foreigners are, are, are treated in terms of uh, how they are provided their, uh, their rights, uh, what they're told about their rights, the Miranda rights in particular. We had a case in Ohio recently where uh, the Mexican government represented, they uh, didn't represent, but on, on appeal filed a brief amicus curiae, a Mexican who was convicted of murder, sentenced to life in prison. Um, and during the preparation of the appeal, it became obvious to the consul who, uh, for the government of Mexico, which happened to be my wife and me, that the Miranda warnings that were given to this fellow uh, in Spanish at the police station in a small town in Ohio at 3 a.m. after arrest were given by a person whose Spanish was at, at uh, you know, a, a six-month level in grade school. Um, that is, the, the Spanish was, was ludicrously inadequate in conveying the content of the Miranda warnings. Um, on the basis of this, the, the Court of Appeals reversed the conviction of murder. Um, I mean, had the, the Mexican government not been involved in that case, that, that, that result uh, might well not have happened. But these, these foreign consuls are becoming very uh, strong on this issue now. And I think uh, this has become an additional significant uh, uh, lobbying force. Um, it, it's been taken one step farther by two states, Paraguay and Germany, that have sued the United States and the International Court of Justice over this issue. Um, uh, the Germany case is proceeding to oral argument in what, two weeks? Uh, November 13th. Thank you. Uh, uh, and the uh, court will be asked by Germany to decide that in the instance where a person is not given rights uh, under the, the Vienna Convention, that is, is not informed at the time of arrest of the right to contact a foreign consul, that the case may not then proceed uh, through to conviction and to a, a death sentence. In other words, that it will be necessary to reverse the, the death sentence, uh, and I think Germany will be saying the conviction as well uh, in those instances. The United States is perfectly willing, in, in the case involving Germany and in many others, to acknowledge that there was a violation of the Vienna Convention obligation. The United States' position is with respect to remedy. The United States says uh, that it is not required as a matter of remedy to reverse the conviction following a, a, a failure to inform. Um, the court, I think, uh, uh, is, is rather likely to take a different view of it. Uh, and may well say that Germany is correct and that there is an obligation uh, in that situation to restore the status quo ante, the normal uh, uh, remedy that's required in international law, uh, and therefore that the convictions should not stand. Um, so I think G Germany will be asking the United States to make a commitment to that effect. Uh, the United States, I think, will not be willing to make a commitment to that effect, so it will be an interesting political situation. Um, part of the problem, of course, for the United States is federalism, that most of the convictions are at the state level, uh, so that it involves a matter of the relations between the federal government and, and, and the states and the governors uh, who have the ultimate power to decide about, about uh, execution. Uh, the, uh, the federalism issue, I, I think, is a, is a very serious one uh, and, and makes it less likely that the United States will uh, succumb to the pressure that's being exerted on it from abroad uh, because it does mean uh, exerting uh, some, some uh, well, uh, spending some political capital, let's say, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the states. Uh, it raises the question of, uh, of uh, 
relationship with the states and, and the, the federal government. Um, but I would um, just make one uh, analogy that, that may or, or may not have some relevance to this situation as we think about the likelihood of the impact. Um, 50 years ago, uh, schools got desegregated, at least by law. Uh, schools got desegregated in the United States. Uh, and the federal government was in the forefront of urging the desegregation of schools. A factor in its decision to do so, I, I think a number of scholars have shown, and I think there's good reason to believe, uh, was concern about the international image of the United States. Um, that the United States was concerned with all the criticism it was getting over, uh, over the segregation in, in this country, uh, in particular coming from the Soviet Union, that we were involved in the Cold War, uh, uh, where the United States was, was, was trying to uh, uh, convince the world that, that we were better than the other guys. Um, in the case of Brown versus Board of Education, the Department of Justice filed a brief as amicus curiae, uh, in which it said, uh, in part, the United States is trying to prove to the people of the world, of any nationality, race, and color, that a free democracy is the most civilized and most secure form of government yet devised by man. It gave that as a reason to the U.S. Supreme Court to uh, prohibit school desegregation in the United States. So I think it was feeling some pressure from abroad on that issue. Um, one can analyze this historically, and now the Cold War is over, so we don't have to worry about that so much. We perhaps uh, are less uh, uh, susceptible to pressure than we were uh, at that point. But um, uh, nonetheless, that was a very important social issue, uh, and it's one on which I think uh, pressure from outside the United States did have an impact in, in changing policy in the United States. And moreover, it was an issue on which federalism was, was key. Uh, if you recall the federal marshals who went to some states in order to enforce school desegregation, it, it, it was uh, every bit as much a uh, contested matter uh, in the realm of federalism as is capital punishment. So. Thank you very much, John. The, uh, uh, what's interesting is, is now about the Vienna Convention is that Mexico is uh, going to spend $300,000 to try to educate uh, Mexican nationals in the United States about their rights under the Vienna Convention to call the consulate. And uh, they're also going to be using this money to help uh, the 40, I think I believe it's 45 Mexican nationals that are on now death row, uh, that are on death row around the country. So thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Virginia Sloan. And uh, Virginia, I first met Virginia when she was the uh, counsel of the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, she headed up a coalition of organizations uh, to uh, preserve habeas corpus, and I became her Michigan coordinator. So that's how I first met uh, Jenny Sloan. She's currently the executive director uh, of what's called the Constitution Project, and uh, uh, it's at the Georgetown University Law Center. And uh, she previously served as executive director of the Task Force on Gender, Race, and uh, Ethnic Bias of the United <coughs> States Courts of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. And uh, as I indicated just a few minutes ago, she is also, was 14, for 14 years, she was the counsel to the House of Representatives Committee on the Judiciary. And uh, she's on uh, a number of other boards uh, around the country, and I know she was uh, doing so. Thank you, Doreen. I, I uh, want to apologize for being late. I was stuck on a train from uh, Washington this morning. Apparently the signal lights went out and no trains were moving. Very sorry to be late. Um, I uh, have been given the task of addressing um, you know, the very practical aspects of what's happening here in the United States, which is, after all, part of the international community as well, although sometimes one um, wouldn't think so, given the way we're, we're acting on issues like this. Um, but uh, I was uh, a counsel to the House Judiciary Committee for any number of years and uh, headed up the uh, uh, efforts, at least on a staff level, to try to save habeas corpus and to limit uh, the expansion of the federal death penalty. Uh, and I want to say, first of all, that uh, what is happening today in this country and internationally is absolutely incredible, given the perspective that a number of us share from many years ago, when uh, with fight after fight after fight that we we lost or we were on the verge of winning only to see it uh, 
all go away in, in Congress. Um, what's happening now is, is almost a 180 degree uh, switch. Um, when, when I was in the House Judiciary Committee, we'd have hearings with uh, five uh, innocent men and their lawyers who had come this close to being executed before evidence of their innocence was discovered. And uh, we uh, brought them to testify before the uh, House uh, Subcommittee on Civil and Constitutional Rights. And we thought, boy, the press is going to be all over this. This is so shocking. The Republicans are just going to turn around and stop opposing our, our uh, legislation to save habeas corpus. And nobody came. Nobody cared. And some of those same men are now the ones that we see over and over again on Frontline and on uh, other national news shows and speaking all over the country. Um, and there's so much interest and there's so much concern. Suddenly people understand that there is a problem, that habeas corpus is one of the, the uh, chief uh, means for protecting constitutional rights in, in state criminal cases uh, and that we've done some very bad things to that law and uh, that the death penalty system is not working the way it's supposed to work. So I want to just briefly talk about uh, the state of public education here in this country, which is what the Constitution Project uh, in Washington does with regard to the death penalty. Uh, a number of you may have read a recent poll, about a recent poll that was uh, uh, done by Heart Research in Washington, national opinion research firm, and it was commissioned by the, the Justice Project. And it gives very clear guidance about uh, three components to uh, any kind of reform effort, uh, whether it's seeking a moratorium or other, other reforms in the death penalty. Um, and uh, I, I think that this poll is just one more piece of evidence about the remarkable turn of events on the, on the death penalty. The poll shows that uh, a majority of Americans still favor the death penalty, but that by wide margins, they are now more concerned about executing an innocent person than about a guilty person who avoids being, in, uh, being executed, which was not the way it was 10 years ago. The poll shows that there is strong support for important reforms that I uh, think uh, probably a number of people in this, in this room uh, support DNA tests, experience defense counsel, the right to present all uh, relevant evidence, uh, adequate funding for defense counsel, access to, um, to all evidence um, uh, that the prosecution has, and informing juries that where the, the law allows it, they have the option of life without possibility of parole. The, the poll also shows that 64% of all voters now favor a suspension of executions until the issue of fairness is studied. And that's one of the things that the Constitution Project is doing. We've put together a bipartisan blue ribbon committee of uh, people who are concerned about the current situation to come up with some consensus recommendations for policymakers. Um, the, the, of the 64% of voters who, who favor suspension of executions, um, this includes 70% of Democrats, 73% of Independents, and 50% of Republicans. It also includes 49% of all those who describe themselves as strong supporters of the death penalty. Again, uh, evidence of an incredible turnaround in public thinking about this issue. And what, what we can conclude, I think most importantly, from this opinion research is that while there are probably, again, many in this room who support abolition, the American public as a whole, the majority of Americans do not support abolition, but they are very, very concerned about the, the situation uh, with regard to the death penalty. Uh, and that while abolition may not be a winning argument, arguments in favor of reform very much are a winning argument. Uh, it's unfortunate, perhaps, that, that arguments in favor of abolition appeal only to a small number of Americans, and that most others support capital punishment either strongly or with reservations. But within those latter groups, most demographic groups are represented. And so when it comes to disseminating a message about the problems with capital punishment, we have to include every audience, every demographic audience of Americans. And we have to rely on arguments 
in favor of abolition to secure our base, but we have to expand our base as well, and we have to do that by appealing to those Americans who support the death penalty, but who are concerned and who feel that reforms need to be implemented in order to make the situation more fair, if in fact that's possible. Um, I think that, that many of you in this room uh, probably already know all the compelling evidence that there is in favor of, of reforms, and I'm sure before I got here it was discussed at length uh, by my uh, fellow panelists. But uh, there is a situation uh, that was in the news just this morning that, uh, that you may or may not be aware of, the case of Calvin Burdine in Texas, uh, the, the case of the sleeping, one of the cases of the sleeping lawyer, and his, uh, his conviction was overturned by the district court, and the Fifth Circuit yesterday by a, a um, a two-to-one vote reinstated his conviction, um, which to me is just stunning and sickening and uh, is just the kind of evidence that Americans, whether they support the death penalty or they don't, can really understand about what is wrong with this system. Um, one final point, uh, we've talked about the, the message and the audience, but uh, we should talk about who the speaker is. And again, uh, polling, uh, opinion research shows that the, that the, the um, speaker who is going to be perceived as most compelling and credible to Americans um, as, uh, um, it is a group of experts who know the system on a, a first-hand basis, um, like judges and prosecutors. And it was this finding that led the Constitution Project to, to create our bipartisan Blue Ribbon Committee. Uh, this kind of group has obvious appeal for the media, too, and media attention is critical to any efforts to try to achieve reforms because the media can uh, obviously affect uh, policymakers as well as the public as, as a whole. And many reporters find it very newsworthy to talk to people who have surprising views on this issue, supporters of the death penalty who are very, very concerned about the, the current situation. They have also repeatedly, um, over the years, interviewed many of the wonderful groups that support abolition. Uh, and they are looking for new voices um, to, to talk about the uh, death penalty. So. Um, these kinds of groups of bipartisan blue ribbon committees, whether on a national level or a state or a local level, can be very, very effective in disseminating a message for reform. Um, the kinds of people that you should have on that kind of committee, um, principally proponents of the death penalty. Otherwise, your committee is going to be viewed as abolitionists and will be seen as, in the minds of many, less than credible. It will be seen as a committee that just wants to get rid of the death penalty. Uh, we have abolitionists on our, uh, our uh, committee, Mario Cuomo is a very prominent example, and you really need abolitionists as well to balance the argument, but, but they have to be more than balanced by people who, who support the death penalty, at least in theory. And secondly, you have to have a diversity of uh, experience. We have former state and federal judges, we have uh, former federal and state prosecutors, and again, uh, former Governor Cuomo. It's very important that these members have practical experience with the death penalty system. Legal academics are very useful in furthering committee uh, discussions, and we have three of them as reporters to the committee, uh, but with no offense, I hope, to the uh, uh, legal academics in the, uh, in the room. The most persuasive uh, communicators of the message are, are going to be people who've had ha hands-on experience with, with the system, and, and if legal academics do, great. Um, but they are not going, they, they should not be in the forefront of communicating um, a, a message on this kind of, of committee. Uh, one of the categories so often ignored in the death penalty debate is families of murder victims. Um, Rennie Cushing of families of murder victims against the death penalty is an incredibly eloquent spokesperson uh, against the death penalty. Uh, and he's someone that uh, a number of us have worked with for years. Uh, we chose deliberately not to have Rennie as a member of our committee because he is an abolitionist, his committee is an abolitionist, um, and uh, we knew that we could find um, members of uh, families of murder victims who were very concerned about the situation but who either support the death penalty in theory or were very concerned and probably with sufficient information would 
uh, change their views and become abolitionists, but they're not there, there yet. Um, and it's always, of course, important to have racial, ethnic, and gender diversity because we all have to keep in mind that uh, the audiences that we're trying to reach are all Americans, and so we need people who understand where all, where all Americans are coming from and what their concerns are. And finally, of course, you need at least one capital defense lawyer uh, who's not afraid to be particularly outspoken, especially when uh, debates with uh, former prosecutors might get somewhat heated. This is an incredibly complex area of the law, and to make accurate recommendations, you need not only prosecutors and judges, but you need the, the viewpoints of defense counsel who can tell you how things work in an accurate way and how they should work in a perfect or at least a better world. Uh, I want to conclude with just a, a brief discussion of the risks of creating this kind of committee. For abolitionists, the risks are obvious. Uh, one is that all the recommendations for reform by this committee might be adopted by policymakers, and then there will be no pressure whatsoever to eliminate the death penalty, and the system will just go on, um, and we will continue killing people in a fairer way if that's possible, but we will go on killing people. Uh, what are the chances of this? Um, in my personal view, virtually none, uh, because as we all know, states have been incredibly resistant to making even the most basic of changes, such as providing uh, competent defense lawyers for people who are accused of capital crimes. So the uh, chances of policymakers in, in each state that has the death penalty and in the Congress uh, adopting this wide array of reforms is, I think, fairly remote. But I also think that so long as we have the death penalty and it doesn't look like it's going away anytime soon, um, at least not nationwide, uh, that we need to do whatever we can to make the system even uh, a little bit fairer. And that's what we're trying to do. And uh, I, I brought some information about our committee and about our mission, uh, if anybody would like it. Uh, might be useful to you in your own efforts on, on this issue, and uh, the Constitution Project is always available to, to give advice on our own experiences to anybody who, who would like it. Our contact information is also on, on the material that I, that I brought. Thank you very much, and again, I'm are you sorry on the web? to be late. Are you on the web? Yes, we are. Uh, www.constitutionprojectoneword.org. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, in the Burdine case, by the way, I was following it this morning, and it said, uh, if you remember that case, uh, what happened was that uh, the newspapers wrote about the fact that Burdine's lawyer was sleeping through almost all of the trial. And, but the court, in reinstating the death penalty, said that Burdine's failure lay in not demonstrating precisely which testimony the lawyer slept through even though the newspapers have said he slept through almost all of it. So that's a sense of the justice coming out of the Fifth Circuit. If I can just add, they also blamed Verdine himself for not having uh, raised the issue, even though from everything that I've read, he did raise the issue in the way that an indigent and uh, uh, a person uneducated in the legal system was able to do, and nobody listened, and the judge was aware, um, everybody in the courtroom was aware, and somehow now the Fifth Circuit is blaming Verdine for his own situation. Our last speaker is Ron Payback. He's the co-chair, along with myself, of the American Bar Association Individual Rights and Responsibilities Death Penalty Committee. Uh, he's also the chair of the Committee on Civil Rights of the Association of the Bar of the City of New York and a member of its Capital Punishment Committee. Uh, he's also a member of the Steering Committee of the ABA Death Penalty Representation Project to get attorneys uh, to assist on death penalty cases. Uh, Ron? Thank you very much, uh, Doreen. Uh, a week ago today, I was speaking in Paris, France, at a program called by people there and elsewhere in Europe on what they could do to deal with the United States death penalty. And I think that um, one of the difficulties that they have there is in understanding why public opinion in this country has been what it has been and where we stand and what might be persuasive. Uh, in my opinion, a uh, major problem has been that there have been discussions of 
the worst possible cases are sort of used as loss leaders. That if, well, if you favor the death penalty in theory for John Wayne Gacy and Ted Bundy, then there's no more reason to discuss the death penalty in theory. And then the discussion of the practice is that there have been ad hoc reports about this unfair case here, that unfair case there, but until very recently, no systemic analysis of how the system is actually working. And the result of that was that when in 1996, Congress was considering badly damaging the writ of federal habeas corpus, which is the means by which after state judges who are often very beholden to political pressures because they're often elected or subject to re-election or subject to appointment processes that have gotten more political, that life-tenured federal judges were able to rule on the merits of claims that people's constitutional rights, their rights under our Bill of Rights, were being violated. And these rights were not technicalities. These rights that were found to be violated were things like changing the burden of proof on the crucial issue of the case to the defendant, uh, having prosecutorial misconduct withhold crucial evidence, having the judge misinform the jury about what their role was in sentencing. And yet, the way that this was framed before Congress, and the way, sadly, this was reported when it passed Congress, is that what they were doing is to eliminate frivolous appeals brought by death row inmates. Now, the, that was fraudulent, and remains fraudulent, as an argument for the so-called Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996. The fact is that frivolous appeals were not going anywhere long before that act was ever passed. What that act was aimed at were meritorious arguments where people's rights, serious constitutional rights, were violated in a way that, well, may have affected their winning the case. And what they did is put in rules that prohibited people from getting hearings in federal courts, and then, if you could get a hearing, would say, well, if the state court got it wrong, but they weren't unreasonable in getting it wrong, they were wrong, but they weren't unreasonably wrong, then the federal court, although they know they were wrong, can't grant relief. Now, this, along with the fact that at the same time the federal government defunded the resource centers that had been established with federal funding to help represent people in federal proceedings in these cases, where what I've called the straws that broke the camel's back at the leading legal association in this country, the American Bar Association, and is what led it in February 1997 to call for a moratorium on executions until all of the following things are dealt with. A, the inadequacies of counsel and systems for providing counsel and having counsel that are beholden to elected judges uh, at all levels of the proceedings. We have to have adequate counsel, properly funded with proper access to experts and investigators. We have to have a meaningful system of review of claims that are meritorious, that people's constitutional rights were violated, where that could make the real difference in the case. We must do something about the pattern of racial discrimination in our death penalty systems. The United States Supreme Court in the McCleskey case in 1987 assumed that there was a pattern of racial discrimination where you're far more likely to get the death penalty if all else were the same, if your victim was white than if your victim was black, but they said that does not violate the United States Constitution. But if you want to do something about it, you can try to create legislation to deal with it. Um, also, the ABA said that before this moratorium could end, that there had to be abolition of the execution of people with mental retardation and juveniles. Now, what has happened since then has been that the situation in terms of how the death penalty is being carried out has generally gotten substantially worse, but that the public understanding of the situation is getting better, although in my opinion not sufficiently better to create a climate in which uh, those politicians who govern by the latest opinion poll 
are willing to, in most states, uh, enact or implement a moratorium on executions. Notwithstanding whatever international uh, efforts people may hear about. Now, what are some of these activities that have occurred and things that have come to public attention? One of them is that there's been major media coverage for cases like Anthony Porter's in Illinois in early 1999. Now, this followed a national conference about innocent people getting the death penalty that was held at Northwestern in late 1998. And one of the leading arguments made by proponents of the death penalty and the way it's being carried out in response to that conference was that the fact that all these people were getting released from death row proved that the system worked. And as much as those at the conference said, oh no, this was all because of flukes and circumstances and things that didn't prove the system worked, it took a case like Anthony Porter's, for those who did pay attention to it, to really strike home. Because what happened in that case was that Anthony Porter was saved from being executed without anybody having any idea he might be innocent because of an issue having nothing to do with whether he was innocent or guilty. What happened was that his lawyers got a stay of execution because of questions about whether he was legally competent to be executed. In other words, the fact that he was mentally retarded was not enough to stop his execution. But the fact that he might not even understand that he was being executed or why he was being executed was an issue. So they then gave him a stay of execution. Now at that point, a group of journalism students at Northwestern who had previously decided not to look into the case because they didn't have enough time before he was going to be executed, said, well, as long as he's not being executed right now, now we'll look into the case. And within a few months, with the help of an outside investigator, they had demonstrated that Porter was not guilty. They found the real killer who conceded his guilt, and Porter was released. Now, it was very difficult after that happened to say that that proved that the system worked. Um, and that made some real difference on public opinion. What then happened in the wake of that was that the Republican-controlled legislature in Nebraska voted in 1999 in favor of a moratorium on executions, as well as a study of the fairness of their system. Now, the governor successfully vetoed the moratorium, but he did not uh, succeed in stopping the study from going on, which is going on there. Then we began to get some really impressive press coverage, particularly at that point, by the Chicago Tribune, not the most liberal newspaper in the country. Uh, they uh, had one series about prosecutorial misconduct, including in death penalty cases, in states around the country. Then they had a series in which they said, in light of all the people on death row in Illinois who had been exonerated, they said, let's look at why they were exonerated and let's see if the same factors that led them to be exonerated exist in other cases of people still on death row in Illinois. Things like the use of unreliable eyewitness testimony where there was no corroborating physical evidence, the use of unreliable jailhouse informants who were promised help, and a variety of other factors. And they found that these same factors existed in cases of people still on death row. And then, when there was the claim made when the governor of Illinois in January of this year did declare a moratorium, in large part, he has said, because of both the Anthony Porter case and the Chicago Tribune series, um, when it was then argued uh, that by other Republican governors and other governors, their reaction was, like Frank Keating in Oklahoma said, Governor Ryan was correct, and if I were the governor of Illinois, I would have declared a moratorium. But Oklahoma's different. We don't need a moratorium because we have a wonderfully fair system. And similar statements were made about Texas and others. So they did a series where they analyzed the death penalty in Texas, and they found it at least as unfair, if not more unfair, than it was in Illinois. But the fact is that these government officials have made these statements with a straight face. But I can tell you, having been in Illinois in 1998, before, well, actually even in 99, after the Anthony Porter case, uh, and testified on behalf of the ABA in support of a moratorium there, uh, that prosecutors there were saying, oh, well, we're not like the South. 
We're Illinois. We are fair. We just have these miscellaneous cases we might have problems with. So these sort of things started happening. Then a very important development that happened earlier in 2000 was the publication with great publicity of the book Actual Innocence by Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Jim Dwyer and Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld. And this didn't just talk about DNA, but it talked about a variety of other things that could lead innocent people to get convicted, including of the death penalty, and get the death penalty. And among the people who reacted to this were such a notable conservative and death penalty supporter as George Will, who said something that we had been hoping that conservatives would say for a long time, which is, Conservatives have always said you can't trust the government to do anything right, except somehow they believed that they could do the death penalty right. And George Will said, you know, maybe you can't really do the death penalty right either. Now, here at this association, the year before that, a program I think Professor Quigley was at, we had uh, Pat Robertson, uh, in effect, endorse the moratorium in response to a question, because he had been very upset about the lack of any real clemency procedure in the Call of Fame Tucker case, and then he learned there wasn't really one in general in Texas. Another development that occurred this year was major media coverage surrounding the execution of Gary Graham in Texas. Now, this was somebody who, mo more likely than not, was innocent of this crime. They had this one eyewitness who the jury heard who claimed to have identified him. The jury never heard from four or five other eyewitnesses all of whom contemporaneously said it was not Gary Graham. Their testimony was never heard by any court. So for all of Governor Bush and other people talking about all the judges who have considered this case, no court and no jury and no judge ever heard any of these witnesses. There was no physical evidence tying him to the crime. He was a juvenile at the time. His case is part of a pattern of racial discrimination in the case. And the case illustrated the Texas non-clemency system where the only person they have granted clemency to is their policy is in Texas that they will consider clemency only if there is 100% proof of innocence. So the one person they have given clemency to is a serial murderer who, however, was totally 100% innocent of the crime they were going to execute him for because beyond any doubt he was in another state at the time of that crime. So that serial murderer has gotten the one clemency grant, but not anybody else. Now, what then happened soon thereafter was that the federal government, which for seven and a half years of the Clinton administration has been administering the federal death penalty, just discovered and were shocked, shocked to learn that there was a pattern of obvious racial discrimination in carrying out the federal death penalty. And they issued a report about this, which got a lot of public attention. And they then commissioned an outside body to look into this further. Um, and at the same time, or around the same time as that, a study by researchers at Columbia University found that there was a high level, over 60% level, of cases where people were gotten the death penalty in the modern era of the death penalty in the United States where they did get relief from some court, either a state court or a federal court, and that um, most of those who got relief where they tried for the death penalty again did not get the death penalty again. Now, this report got a lot of coverage, although some of the responses to it were rather bizarre, such as some of the states where the rate of reversal were the lowest, like Virginia, said, well, this proved that we have a wonderfully fair system because we never reverse cases for anybody, and neither does the Fourth Circuit. Well, in reality, that just demonstrates how unfair the death penalty is there because people who would get relief for the same claims if they were in another state are being denied it in the Virginia courts. And one reason for that is that in Virginia, they have had a rule, although within the last two weeks, the Virginia Supreme Court has said they may now alter it, we don't know exactly how, where if you have new evidence, including evidence of innocence, and you wait more than 21 days after your conviction to bring forward this new evidence, you are not allowed to raise it in any court. They have also had cases like the case of uh, Roger Coleman, where there's substantial doubt whether he was guilty, but there are also plenty of other doubts and other issues in the case, where because the pro bono lawyers who are from the state of New York 
or Washington, uh, DC District of Columbia, who were doing the case, were told by the clerk of the court that their appeal was due on a certain date, and they were turned out to be wrong by, depending on how you count it, one day or three days later. The United States Supreme Court, in a ruling that began, this is a case about federalism, held that all of his claims were barred, and he was not allowed to get a ruling on the merits of any of his claims. Now, that is the way federalism is being interpreted by our courts today, and that is also why you cannot accept the low rate of reversals in cases out of Virginia as a showing of anything other than unwillingness to deal with unfairness. And I'll give you a few more examples from there shortly. Another thing that has begun happening in the last year is that the Catholic Church has come out strongly and unequivocally against the death penalty, and they have announced a joint project with conservative and reform Jewish groups on in support of moratoriums and against the death penalty. For example, Cardinal Bevilacqua of Philadelphia, who is a lawyer admitted to practice in the United States Supreme Court, testified for the first time ever in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, in support of moratorium legislation there, something that is also supported by the Philadelphia and Pennsylvania Bar Associations, but which they have not enacted. And then there has been, in addition to the Chicago Tribune, other systemic coverage of what the reasons are for the unfairness of the death penalty, not just ad hoc coverage of one particular case that leaves you shaking your head about that case, but not thinking, does this demonstrate any broader problem? And so, for example, most recently, the Chicago, the Charlotte Observer in North Carolina, a state where there is a state commission studying the fairness of the death penalty, had a multi-part report in uh, the month of September of 2000 about how unfair, in numerous respects, the death penalty is being carried out in both North Carolina and South Carolina. And Nightline had a four-part series that week where they, one of their reports illustrated that if you lived on one side of the street, you probably would never get the death penalty because the DA there almost never sought it. And if you were across the street, that DA sought it almost all the time. And that even within states like Texas, there are certain district attorneys whose view is they will seek the death penalty every time they might seek it under law, and there are other times prosecutors who actually execute discretion as to whether they will seek the death penalty. And there are major uh, differences in that regard. Now, even the New York Times, which has been a bastion of ignorance and disrespect for the intelligence of their readers in terms of their news coverage of the death penalty, and has said that their readers, when we have gone and talked to their national news editors, would not understand some of these issues, these systemic issues, would not understand what habeas corpus is, and I tell them, well, high school students in five minutes understood it when I spoke to them. He said, well, our readers would not. Uh, <laughs> they have begun to do some excellent front page stories this year on certain systemic aspects of the death penalty. I hope they will do more. Now, what has happened just this month, in the month of October, have included that NPR carried a documentary on all things considered called Witness to an Execution, where they had the warden of death row of prison in Huntsville and others involved in the execution process talk about that. And you learned there, if you didn't know it otherwise, that we have been losing some of the best prison guards and prison officials because of the death penalty, and it causes them major problems. Particularly when they see that the person they're now executing is not the same person, does not have the same personality, has become a different person, has learned from their mistakes while on death row. And so what do we then do? We execute them. In the state of Virginia, which I talked about, where Earl Washington had been found by DNA evidence several years ago to almost certainly be not guilty of the crime for which he is on death row, and in response to that, they magnanimously commuted his sentence, so he wasn't executed, he came within a few days of execution, to life without parole. They now did more DNA testing, which showed he definitely didn't do it, so now they have magnanimously gotten rid of his sentence for that crime, but he's still in jail for some previous crime, even though he would have been uh, paroled for that one long ago, had it not been for the erroneous conviction of the crime for which he was innocent. He also was mentally retarded, I should note. 
Um, then we found out that in Texas, um, DNA tests had cleared two prisoners who weren't in for death penalty for other crimes, and that Governor Bush's office had ignored a confession by someone who actually did it uh, that had come in, in 1998, uh, and only now are they getting relief. Then the Texas Defender Service issued a very detailed report on the death penalty in Texas about a week and a half ago, which I commend for you to look at on the internet and through the death penalty information website, as well as Ginny's, but their website is deathpenaltyinfo.org. You can then tie in to these reports. It is a very extensive report, and then just two or three days ago, uh, I think it was two days ago on Thursday, the Quixote Center issued a report on people who were executed, who there is significant reason to believe may well have been innocent. Then, as was mentioned earlier, there was a conference at the Carter Center, and as a result of that conference, not only did Rosalind Carter call for a nationwide moratorium, but President Jimmy Carter, who signed into law the reenactment of the death penalty in Georgia in the early 1970s, came out for a moratorium. Also this month, the 89th innocent inmate to be released from death row since Furman, William Nieves, was freed in Philadelphia when a jury acquitted him of the murder for which he had been sentenced to death, um, and he got a new trial because of inadequate representation. Meanwhile, we had Miguel Flores, a Mexican national, scheduled to be executed in Texas on November 9th, not coincidentally shortly after the election, uh, his is a case where, as the Mexican government is pointing out, the trial lawyer failed to offer any mitigating evidence during the sentencing phase. So therefore, the jury never found out that he had no criminal record, uh, that he had good character and positive attributes. And I think this is important because it is a lot of the attention that there has been on the death penalty has been about innocence. But it is very important to recognize, and even some of the legislation in Congress has only been about innocence. But if you had a death penalty permeated by racial discrimination or permeated by people who got there because of disproportionate patterns by different prosecutors who wouldn't have gotten it, uh, where the person who's the real murderer doesn't get the death penalty and is, uses the witness against the less culpable person, or if you had a system with mentally retarded people getting the death penalty, even if they were guilty, or if you had a system in which it's because of the inept quality of the people's lawyers that the jury never learned about their mental retardation or never learned that they had uh, been a Vietnam veteran and then had post-traumatic stress disorder, as did someone in California who the governor, for political reasons, refused to give clemency uh, in 1999. That is something that would call out for a moratorium, in our view, in our, our in this case being the ABA. And so what I would suggest is that the following are kinds of people who could all support moratoriums, regardless of what they may think in theory about a theoretical death penalty, which does not, at least at this time, and never has existed in this country. One, those who believe that every human life is sacred, and that in killing any human being, the state commits an outrage against the providential gift of life. Or, two, those who believe that life and death are mysteries beyond all human understanding and feel that the state should not commit an act whose nature and consequences it cannot know. Or, three, those who regard the death penalty as a sin against intelligence, as a lashing out in fear and rage against a relatively few people, a feudal ritual that distracts society and diverts its scarce resources from the vital work of finding real effective ways to control crime. Or, Four, those who believe that the death penalty is exploited by self-serving politicians who seek to rise to power or stay in power by promoting popular hysteria about crime and pandering to that hysteria. Or, five, those who believe that the policymakers and public officials who administer the death penalty are making a genuine conscientious effort to do so fairly and even-handedly, but are troubled by the inability of these professionals to change the fact that capital punishment continues to fall with unequal harshness upon racial and ethnic minorities, the poorer and unpopular outcasts, people who never had a chance to make a place in society where that society then seizes on them for execution, 
even though others who commit the same crimes are punished less severely because they form stronger roots in a community in which they were more welcome in the first place. Or, six, those who are worried about the execution of innocent people through mistake, given the fallibility of human judgment, the issues of truth and probability that have to be resolved in trying these cases, the competitive atmosphere that surrounds the investigation and prosecution of community arousing violent crimes, and the fact that so many innocent people have been found in recent years to have been sentenced to death in our country, even though this number of people does not reflect an increase in that phenomenon, but only a recent increase in our reporting and attention to it. Or, seven, those who are concerned with what the death penalty does to societies and systems of law that use it, how it distorts and erodes the fabric of moral and legal norms that are twisted and emptied of meaning in an effort to justify taking human life on the basis of procedures that are known to be fallible, error-prone, and responsive to the urges of vengeance, prejudice, and primal rage. Or, finally, eight, those who, even assuming that everybody on death row is guilty as charged, are upset at society's pretense that imperfect human institutions are acting today in a way good enough to make decisions about who should live and who should die, but who might support it if they concluded otherwise. And I would add one possible other group, which are those who are concerned that the United States' ability to be effective in enforcing its thoughts about, or persuading people about its thoughts on human rights on other issues around the world may join with some of our allies in those other fights for human rights who out of sadness rather than out of a sense of superiority are wanting to tell us, as the people in France were trying to tell us at this conference last week, that you are harming our joint effort to promote human rights by carrying out a death penalty system in which the likelihood of getting the death penalty depends more on how bad the lawyer is than on how bad your conduct was, how which prosecutor prosecuted your case, which judge in which state heard your appeals, what kind of racial discrimination there was, and how much your resources were, that even if you favored the death penalty in theory, that this kind of system is one well deserving of a moratorium, whether or not it ever leads to abolition. Thank you. Obviously, I agree with many of the things said here. One issue that hasn't been raised is the issue of cameras in the courts. New York has a law dean, John Ferrick, of Fordham University, who's come out overwhelmingly for having cameras in the courts. Now, you complain about publicity. Obviously, if you had cameras, the public would then see what does and doesn't go on, and perhaps that alone would sway in certain states. That's one issue. The second issue is, yes, you can't necessarily get, let's say, a national moratorium. However, if you direct it at specific states and you do allow cameras in the courts, you can have specific states at least consider it. In other words, break down the problem into manageable parts. Uh, would you like to direct the Okay, I, I, I'll invite you, Mr. Tayback, if you want, to like come to. on Public Access TV and debate some of the issues related. Well, I'm willing to come on anywhere. I've gone on, on court TV and argued against Cameron the courts, not on behalf of the ABA, but on behalf of myself. And the fact of the matter is that in this, many of the states where the worst death penalties have cameras in the courts, and what happens is that the prosecutors play to the cameras.